Today is April 1st, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Lori London in Washington. Coming up, grim estimates on the number of likely COVID-19 deaths in the United States. It's a matter of life and death, frankly. It's a matter of life and death. Did the virus get transmitted to humans from a bat, or was it another highly trafficked animal? Also ahead, more questions than answers for now on how pregnant women can keep themselves and their unborn child safe. It's all on today's International Edition. There are more than 845,000 global infections of COVID-19 and more than 41,000 deaths worldwide. The U.S. now has the most cases, as the White House Tuesday suggested that if social distancing measures continue to be followed, between 100 and 240,000 people in the U.S. will die. President Trump on Tuesday released his 30-day guidelines aimed at slowing the spread and warned Americans to take it seriously. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead. We're going to go through a very tough two weeks. And then hopefully, as the experts are predicting, as I think a lot of us are predicting after having studied it so hard, you're going to start seeing some real light at the end of the tunnel. But this is going to be a very painful, very, very painful two weeks. At Tuesday's White House briefing, Trump and health officials projected that if social distancing measures had not been put in place across the country, between one and a half million and 2.2 million people would have died. In hard-hit New York, the Mammoth Convention Center has now started taking patients to ease the burden on the city's overwhelmed health care system. As officials in New York and other states continue to plead for more equipment, the Pentagon says it's still waiting for the Department of Health and Human Services to say where it wants to ship thousands of ventilators. AP correspondent Tim McGuire reports. Lieutenant General Giovanni Tuck, the Pentagon's top logistical officer, tells reporters the military hasn't delivered any of the 2,000 ventilators it offered to the Department of Health and Human Services some two weeks ago. Tuck says an initial shipment of 1,000 of the critical care machines has been on hold after HHS told them to wait until the department can determine where to send the machines. Governors from New York to Louisiana to Michigan have been begging for the life-saving breathing machines. Tuck says that the military has also offered 5 million respirator masks. 1.5 million have been shipped. Another half million will be shipped this week. They're still waiting to hear back from HHS on where to send the remaining 3 million masks. Tim McGuire, Washington. Here are some of the other top stories we are keeping an eye on. Italy and Spain held a moment of silence Tuesday to honor victims of the coronavirus and their families. Spain has more than 95 confirmed cases and over 8,000 dead, while Italy has reported more than 11,000 lives lost, including dozens of doctors. The two countries account for more than half of the deaths globally so far. The captain of a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier facing a growing outbreak of the coronavirus is asking for permission to isolate the bulk of his roughly 5,000 crew members on shore. The extraordinary move would take the warship out of duty in an effort to save lives. The captain of the USS Theodore Roosevelt says the spread of the disease is ongoing and accelerating. He says removing all but 10 percent of the crew is a necessary risk in order to stop the spread. The ship is docked in Guam. The head of the International Council of Nurses on Monday said more equipment is needed to protect the world's nurses working on the front lines to save lives. We're incredibly concerned about the rates of health worker infections at the moment. Uh, in the last few days, we've heard reports from Italy of infection rates around about 9%. Uh, that's too high. Uh, but even more recently from Spain, infection rates at 12 or 13%. And of course, we're not testing everybody. So I think there's a very real risk that infection rates in some areas may actually be 
higher. Um, we have also, in most recent days, had the very tragic news that some nurses have also lost their life in Italy, in Spain, uh, in Indonesia, in Iran as well. Nurses caring for COVID-19 patients have drawn blood samples, put them on oxygen and intravenous fluids, as well as helped intubate those in serious conditions. The organization is repeating calls by the World Health Organization for manufacturers to step up production of masks, gloves, gowns and other equipment to protect vulnerable health care workers. We have no doubt that the rate of infections uh, is related in part to the lack of PPE, personal protective equipment. We know that there is a global shortage uh, and nurses obviously are at a higher risk given the people who that they're caring for and without their protect that protection, uh, their safety, their welfare is also at risk. That's something that we just shouldn't be doing on a moral, moral and ethical basis. We need to be protecting and supporting our nurses and our healthcare workforce as increasing numbers of European hospitals buckle under the strain of tens of thousands of coronavirus cases, the crisis has exposed a surprising paradox. Some of the world's best health systems are remarkably ill-equipped to handle a pandemic, which is why officials warn lower-income nations with even weaker health care systems are especially in need of protective gear. The coronavirus outbreak is disrupting pregnancy plans for many U.S. women and adding anxiety and uncertainty to an already stressful time. As the science remains unclear, women are fleeing COVID-19 hotspots to give birth in safer areas. Others are looking for midwives to help them deliver their babies at home. Joining us now to talk more about this is Ginger Breedlove, past president of the American College of Nurse Midwives and founder of Grow Midwives. Thank you so much for being with us. So we know that some hospitals are imposing limits on loved ones in the delivery room. Others are saying infected women need to be separated from their newborns until testing negative. Uh, we really don't know much. We know uh, the nation's first registry of COVID-19 infected pregnant women was launched last week at the University of California in San Francisco. But in the meantime, what, what do you say to all of this confusion for expectant families at a time that can already be dis so stressful for them? A lot of confusion about testing and resources, personal protective equipment. Uh, so those are two major areas that there certainly are recommendations for, but have not been implemented by all hospitals where 97% of women give birth. I know of personal stories of providers who were told to go to work if they had minor symptoms and were never tested, and then unknowingly were positive a week later. I am aware of facilities that are well-equipped and have everything they need, and other facilities who are not allowing their staff to wear anything than one mask, which they use from the beginning of the day wow. through their entire day. So the lack of testing, which maybe the Abbott lab test will help with, that just was announced at the White House, five to 13 minute test could assure our providers that they're healthy. Right. And for rapid testing for pregnant people entering the hospital so that their treatment regimen isn't misinterpreted when in fact they have a seasonal allergy instead of COVID-19. I mean, yeah. You brought up a good point. I mean, healthcare providers who could have been exposed and who are reusing face masks, dealing with someone about to deliver a baby, that would be the last thing they would want to do is to give it to, to one of their patients. Exactly. And the fact that we're, we're talking about so much intensity of putting stress just on the childbearing family, some places not letting support people come, some places not letting you breastfeed your baby, you have to pump your milk and a healthcare provider is going to feed the baby, you know, uh. separating moms and babies when in fact... We could be in an environment where we don't even know if they're being exposed as healthy families by undiagnosed 
caregivers. You know, we hear a lot about PPE, personal protective equipment for people dealing with COVID patients and other hospitalized individuals that are not hospitalized for COVID-19, but don't obviously want to give them to vulnerable people, but then there's the whole maternity issue. You mentioned breastfeeding. There is no evidence currently whether or not a baby can get infected through breast milk, is there? We don't have sufficient evidence to know that. What I think what's interesting to me about this, Lori, is why aren't we looking at the China data? There's plenty of data. Is it necessary to get it through rigorous research and publication? Or can we get on calls, which I was on last week with 2,000 healthcare providers, listening to four physicians from Wuhan, China, Northern and Southern Italy, and New York City. And what can we learn without believing it has to be high-grade level evidence published in a peer-reviewed journal? The World Health Organization and CDC currently disagree about breastfeeding a baby. Really? Even if you're COVID positive. So the World Health Organization recommends that women who want to breastfeed should continue to breastfeed using respiratory hygiene, meaning a mask, washing hands before and after, and the CDC has a completely different set of recommendations. So what has happened in the United States? Many hospitals are instituting the CDC recommendations, which include separation from your baby and you cannot breastfeed your baby. And other institutions are adopting the WHO guidelines, which are endorsed by the International Lactation Association, IBC. And we're only talking about people who have tested positive or anyone no, that has symptoms? We're talking about anyone who's positive or has symptoms. Those moms are, are in isolation. It's so hard for families to be able to take on informed decision-making. Mm-hmm and make the decisions about risk when we have conflicting mm, yeah. agencies. Lastly, I would just be curious to know if you're seeing more and more women just decide they don't want to risk being exposed, so they want to have the baby at home, and if that is creating a rise in the need for midwives. I think it's more than scaling up and mainstreaming midwifery or really addressing home birth or community birth, which includes birthing centers, right, that mm -hmm. already exist. Right. It, it's, it is a debate that is building quickly day by day about families' fears. And the big issues that arise again go back to two basic premises. Testing, we know that if someone's COVID positive, they have more risks of respiratory problems that could come from pregnancy, labor and birth. They should be in a the hospital. They shouldn't be delivering in the community. Mm. But if we're not testing, how do we know? Right. <laughs> And the providers who are providing the care in the community need to make sure they're not spreading it to other members of the community by their own personal protective equipment and ability to maintain a safe, non-infectious environment. So, yes, there are women turning, flocking. The numbers are going up, seeking home birth and birth center birth. But I, I'm working with a group of thought leaders who are trying to propose that we could create alternative birth settings beside hospitals, just like the FEMA director said for other cases in dorms, in hospital hotels near hospitals. Mm and have low-risk healthy families not entering a hospital that's full of COVID patients. But that's going to require that we know that this healthy alongside facility. That's Ginger Breedlove, past president of the American College of Nurse Midwives and founder of Grow Midwives. Authorities in the region immediately to the east of Paris have recruited refugees to work in the harvest. Farmers have been saying they risk not being able to bring in crops during this crisis. International Edition Steve Miller speaks to Paris-based journalist Catherine Field to learn more. We have the report that, uh, you know, agricultural areas east of Paris are looking to hire migrant workers to work in the agricultural sector because farmers and growers are worried they aren't going to be able to meet the demand for produce. So what can you tell us about this program? 
Over the last couple of years, France has really depended on workers, particularly from Eastern Europe, other European Union countries, to come in and pick the fruit and also to plant. Uh, each year, there are some 200,000 seasonal workers who come to France for this. The problem is now, of course, most borders in Europe are closed, countries are in lockdown, people are just not moving. And now we're coming right up to the time when a lot of the early fruit and veg needs to be picked. And some of the plants for crops that are going to be coming around in June, they need to be planted. Uh, so this area, Seine-Marne, which is to the southeast of Paris, uh, really just phoned around wherever they could and ended up uh, phoning up these uh, refugee centres uh, in the area saying, is there anyone there that wants to come and work? They will be working legally. They'll be getting a minimal wage, plus they'll be getting health benefits. Uh, they just need to come and work. And 56 uh, refugees or people looking to gain asylum in France have stepped up to the plate. They say that they will go and work. In particular, uh, they're ready to start work to pick these strawberries and asparagus and to try and get some of this agricultural work going again, because not only is sine very important for France's export market. It's vital for Paris. It provides fresh fruit and vegetables to the Paris region. And if that starts to, that whole area of agriculture starts to fall apart, then you're really going to start having problems within the population. What about concerns over the migrants' safety in terms of doing work? Because as you mentioned, borders have been closed, restrictions on travel, people being told to practice social distancing and minimize their contact with others. But if they're out in the fields, you know, what kind of safeguards are in, in order to try and protect them to get them, you know, in, in a healthy environment? You're quite right. Uh, this was one of the big questions uh, that came up was, will they have the same protection as other workers? Well, yes, they say they will be outside, they will be in the fresh air, and there will be social distancing. Uh, they will, of course, receive training on safety and other measures as well as that. Another question that did come up was, you know, why the refugees? Why go and pick these people uh, when there are lots of other French people who are sitting at home uh, who could do this job? Uh, to which the prefect of the region replied, well, you know, if you want to come and work here, you come and work here, but I needed workers. These people are offered the work and they've taken it and they're being paid. Uh, so it really was quite a bit of polemic around when they first got the job. But certainly you know, they're going to be trained, they're going to have something to do. And let's not forget, you know, this particular area of France has been open to a lot of the young migrants who've been coming in. Let's just have a look back, back in November 20. 2019, just last year, it took in 100 young single men who'd been living in shanty towns in Paris, took them in, uh, has been looking after them, giving them health care. A year before, they took in 240 young migrants who'd been living on the streets of Paris. They were being looked after in Red Cross ho hospitals there. So you know, these are people who are, have been part of the community there for a long time, and they do know, they're well aware of not just the, the importance of hygiene, but also they're well aware of what has to be done now in this new COVID-19 world. What about the economics of the situation? You mentioned that they are going to be paid a, a minimum wage and look for after with health care and whatnot, but this is also coming where we're facing a worldwide recession. Well, the, the first point there is how are they going to be able to get those those crops picked and to get the crops for, for the June harvest planted? Well, the government has said, and all governments across Europe have said, uh, they will make sure that happens. And the European Union officials based in Brussels are also coordinating there to try and get some sort of movement going on that. The To be honest with you, the first issue is going to be feeding everyone's own population, making sure that that gets uh, to the actual markets, gets to stores, because a lot of these small farms, in, particularly in France and Germany, that had been struggling economically, they were based very much around the idea of selling direct to the public. People would actually go there and they'd feel much better buying fresh fruit and vegetables from the farmers themselves. So that's gone away. And so they're having to put in place a whole new structures, not just to pick these vegetables, but then to get them 
to stores across the country. The next point, of course, yes, you're quite right. How are they going to get these products to export? The same area to the east of Paris is one of the major producers of cereal in France. Well, usually that cereal would have gone for export. Uh, whether they'll be able to get it for export this year is still a big question. But the governments, not just in the capitals in, in Europe, but also in Brussels, have said, you know, our pockets are deep and they will be very deep when it comes to making sure in particular that farmers, producers get whatever help they need, particularly financial, to keep going and to keep getting those fruit and vegetables and cereals out and out to the public. Strict measures to try to slow the spread of COVID-19 have have come into force in Australia. Public gatherings of just two people are now to be permitted and the authorities say police will be actively enforcing measures. Australia has also announced the biggest spending program in its history to help protect businesses from the crisis. From Sydney, Phil Mercer reports. Two's company, but three is now a crime in Australia. On-the-spot fines could be issued to those who flout new social gathering regulations. There are potential penalties too for anyone leaving their home without a reasonable excuse. Enforcing the restrictions will vary across Australia's states and territories. The New South Wales State Premier is Gladys Berejiklian. If you need to work, of course you need to leave the house. If you need to buy essentials, of course you need to leave the house or get medical attention. Or if you're doing your exercise, there are acceptable reasons to leave the house. But beyond that, nobody should be really leaving the house. You can't just socialise as you used to. That's not allowed anymore. All of us have to adjust. Authorities in the Northern Territory are warning Australians from other parts of the country to stay away or be forced to pay for mandatory quarantine. In Western Australia, cruise ship passengers are being placed into isolation on a tourist island off the city of Perth. Pubs, gyms, cafes and beaches have closed as COVID-19 forces much of Australia to grind to a halt. The government has announced an unprecedented $80 billion package to protect the jobs of 6 million workers. It's the third major stimulus measure so far as the authorities try to limit the economic damage of the pandemic. In total, direct government spending on workers and businesses now stands at around $130 billion. Ministers say the debt will take generations to pay off. Phil Mercer for VOA News, Sydney. Botswana's president has declared an indefinite state of emergency effective Thursday after the southern African country recorded its first confirmed cases of coronavirus. Botswana had appeared to be keeping the virus at bay, but on Monday night, the country's health minister announced three people who had traveled abroad tested positive. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Lori London in Washington. Please take care and be well.